Welcome to another episode of Conduct Detrimental. Dan Lost, Dan Wallet. We are back again. Dan, how's the conference circuit been? I've seen you all over the place. So you're jogging in Boston. I see you at Fenway Park. I feel like you're yeah. living it up. I'm in, I'm in all the great cities. You know, one of the great things about the gambling industry is there's no shortage of conferences. And if you like to travel and you want an excuse to, to, to go somewhere, it's the best industry, probably even better than the sports law circuit, which has maybe, a, you know, the law schools and the, and the SLA. Well, we're going to have to fill that void someday, by the way, but that's a topic for another day. The gambling industry conference, sports betting, you could literally go somewhere every week or twice a month in the United States. So, Boston for the National Council of Legislators from Gaming States. I just finished that up. And now I'm in New York City, where I'm going to the SBC Gaming Summit, which begins in New York City tomorrow. And there's a panel with Charles Oakley on it. Maybe we could get him for a guest and talk about his, his lawsuit against James Dolan. So I'm going to work that angle. And well, just don't, just don't get the man angry, Dan. I, I hear he has a temper. Charles Oakley will be loving everything, I'm going to tell him. My favorite Knicks of all time. And then I'm going to Secaucus, New Jersey for the continuation of that conference. So eight days in a row away from the home base, living out of hotel rooms. But life doesn't is not too bad here in the Sofitel, you know, in Midtown Manhattan. So this is one of the nicest hotels I've been in. And the background for my, you know, for the video portion of our podcast, probably the best background I've ever had. So the, the Sofitel Hotel gets the MVP so far as the best hotel. Yeah, you, Dan, you, I'm going to disagree with you. Your best background is that one time you decided to record outside of the cigar bar. That, uh, that was my favorite background of yours. I have my voice back after a week. It was funny, Dan, someone at work, I was losing my voice and I have to now preface, I had a non-COVID related illness. You got to be very specific these days. Somebody told me, I, so I have, uh, I have two little kids and someone said, you're at this period of, of your life where your little kids come home with, you know, they see all these kids at daycare and, you know, you're much more prone to sickness. So no, no one tells you these things, Dan. You know, you have little kids running around that, that they're like basically like Petri dishes, but I'm back. My little girl is now is basically a fish. She knows how to swim, to jump in the pool. So it was a good weekend. Some r and But Dan, we've got a busy week ahead of us in terms of sports law. And one of our cases that we've been keeping close tabs on might be moving that much closer to a decision. That is the one, the only Deshaun Watson. Last time you and I were on the podcast, Dan, was actually, uh, you haven't been on in, in a while live. That was our two hour or three hour Twitter spaces, you know, recap we did. So we put the audio over here, you know, the updates. And I I think we touched it briefly. Judge Robinson allowed for briefs, which we're going to get into, but legal briefs were due by July 11th. Uh, Depends when you're listening to this, but that was on Monday. And, you know, um, we're going to get into the page lengths and timeframe. But yeah, that's what was uh, was happening this past week. The NFL and NFLPA were writing these briefs. And then Dan, uh, you know, as we talked about offline, you know, there was some talk of maybe these being hundreds of pages, but we'll get into it. So, Dan, let's let's start before we get into all the new stuff with the amount of women and the standard. Let's talk about the briefs for a second. What are you hearing on the on the briefs front? Well, the the, the new collective bargaining agreement addresses it. It's Article 46. And just like, uh, you know, in the federal court system, there are page limits. Now, unsurprisingly, there are also deadlines. Usually the briefs have to be filed within three days following the conclusion of the hearing. Well, we know that it's gone longer than that because the briefs are due on July 11th, but there's a, there's a catch-all provision which gives the, 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 the disciplinary officer and or the parties the right to extend, you know, shorten or lengthen some of the deadlines. But what's not adjustable uh, is the page limit, which is five single space pages. So I don't know how you, if you've ever done a post-trial brief, can you imagine you went to trial for three days and the judge said, well, I want to get five page limit single space, we would look at him like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and this is, this is, this is Jeffrey Kessler, you know, Winston and Strawn. This is National Football League represented by, you know, White Shoe Law Firm. Deshaun Watson may have his own separate counsel. Five pages, you're going to see some like crazy machinations with margins, font size. <laughs> you're going to go from like 12 point Times New Roman to, I don't know, can you go down to like seven or eight? The, the, you could just use footnote font for all There's tricks. Pages. There's some tricks here. There's some tricks yeah. involved. I, I don't know all of them, but uh, maybe we could reach out to appellate Twitter for some, for some guidelines. But alas, I think reason will probably win out. And I think the ju- given the type of proceeding this is, the duration of the hearing, 
and the issues, some of which could be quite complicated legally, particularly on the application of the burden of proof and then the disparate discipline defense. It wouldn't surprise me if the union and the league and Judge Robinson agreed to lengthier briefs. I mean, that's like, you know, it doesn't matter that the CBA limits it. They're the parties to the CBA. They can they can agree to anything they want to agree to. And I, and I can't imagine how either side would want to be hamstrung to five pages. Uh, so that might be another instance where everybody agrees to sort of, you know, amend the CBA and agree on a lengthier brief. And I, I would imagine what would be appropriate here if we're talking about five offenses, four offenses and all these legal issues, we've got to be looking at at least 30 pages. The reason that you limit it to five single space pages is because you don't want to overwhelm the judge with all of these papers, right, and delay the potential decision um, and the disciplinary action. So that's that's why you would limit the pages because He's got no other you, cases. But no, but just hypothetically, if you allowed right no page limit, you put a hundred pages in, and you allowed people three weeks to write fifty pages, that would delay the decision by that much longer because the judge would need time to go through it. So you know that's why you would limit it to five. Obviously, I see why uh, one would well, probably want to avoid or, or get around that that cap here. So Dan, sticking on the point of you know time frame, and I, we we want to talk about the standard. We want to talk about the number of women involved, which there's been some reporting on recently. And time permitting, we'll talk a little Baker Mayfield too. But um, let let's stick to the timing here. So right now, there's nothing further. The judges heard oral arguments in the case. She's heard from um, you know both the NFL and the NFLPA. She's now having the opportunity to read the written submissions here. Uh, friend of the podcast. Well, actually, your friend. I, I, I say friend of the podcast when they're both of our friends. But Mike Florio, um, you know, you and I were talking offline is thinking about a date in the, in the you know, in maybe in two weeks in July in mid mid 20s. Um, is that your sense, too, Dan? You think it's going to be longer? I think it's going to be a little longer. I think before week one, but July 20th seems pretty aggressive. Well, nothing occurs in a vacuum when it comes to the decision making on a phase one level disciplinary decision, because there's the prospect of having an appeal to the NFL commissioner. I mean, each side losing side or the the unhappy side it could be both sides that take an appeal that has to be done in fairly short order and we'll we'll talk about that process in a second and then following an appeal which was heard by Roger Goodell where he's limited to modifying the amount of discipline it's possible that there could be a federal court judicial review of arbitrator Goodell's decision so when, we, when we've looked at similar cases involving Ezekiel Elliott and Tom Brady, there was always enough runway to ensure that those cases came to a halt, at least through the federal court system, in time for the beginning of the NFL season. So if you're, if you're Judge Robinson here thinking about, well, geez, I want to I make sure that there's finality before the start of the regular season, I, I think you've got, you've got to decide you got to issue a ruling by the last week of July, because then you leave a little bit of time for Roger Goodell's appellate review. Could be two weeks, could be three weeks. And then, of course, you want to be able to go into federal court if necessary and secure either a preliminary injunction or get a final adjudication on what is likely going to be a summary expedited proceeding. And we're almost at the point of no return if you want to ensure getting through all those gauntlets and having the possibility of a final ruling by a federal court before week one of the NFL season. So I can't see how this goes beyond the end of August. However, looking back at some other disciplinary decisions involving Tom Brady, uh, going back to Barbara Jones and the Ray Rice case, some of those rulings occurred more than one month. Both of those rulings occurred more than one month after the hearings took place before the judge and before arbitrator Roger Goodell. So using past precedent as an indicator of future performance, well, yeah, it could be the middle of August, but I think that's unrealistic considering that the judge is well aware of the two levels of review where this may go next. So a couple of things, talking about dates, and Dan, you, you broke that down beautifully, just so people have a full time frame here. August 4th is the start of the NFL's preseason. Uh, so preseason is about a month, a little give or take. Week one of the NFL season technically begins on September 8th, but the Browns opener is September 11th. Coincidentally, they're playing uh, the Panthers, where they just shipped Baker Mayfield off to. So those are where you're looking at. I read somewhere, Dan, that Watson is not allowed to play during the preseason, but I, I haven't seen that confirmed by anyone official. But 
we'll see. I mean, obviously there's reasons, reasons not to play him for, for a number of levels, but okay, Dan. So that's the time frame. That's what we're looking at. Um, the NFL is always, it, it, they've said this for a reason. They want a decision on the Watson case by the end of this summer. So the end of the summer, right? That if you want to get pretty, I don't know, it's, that's technically August, the end of the summer, but it could come sooner. And I don't know what else Judge Robinson is dealing with. That's important. This is probably the only case that she's dealing with right now. Um, so I, I can't I have to imagine this is a top, top priority. But, but while, while she's no longer a federal judge, Dan, she, do, she doesn't have federal judicial law clerks. I mean, in, in, when she was on the bench, she probably had two or three law clerks that could help her write opinions. But now she's got real lawyers. She's got real lawyers at her law firm that associates, partners, you know, it's the Lanham LLP law firm. So I would imagine that it could be an all hands on deck situation where she has some, you know, bench support to help her get this opinion out. Now, Mike Florio predicted the week of July 25th. I think he's right, but he may not be right for the reasons he thinks that it will be July 25th. I think July 25th coincides with ensuring that there's enough runway left to do a, a second tier appeal to, to Roger Goodell. And then if necessary, a federal court lawsuit with hearings on that before a federal judge. So July 25th would I think leave enough time to wrap everything up before the beginning of the NFL season. So I'm with, I'm with Florio probably for different reasons than he posits, but I think we're essentially in the same ballpark. Uh, I guess it is what it is to a certain extent. I, I will say this one thing, which, you know, again, we have our lawyers that listen to us. We have our, um, you know, our sports fans, it, m- more often than not, and Dan, you could disagree with me. It's just as my personal experience. The judge usually ha- understands or, or has a feeling of where they want to go once the oral arguments are done. Not all the time do, does a judge ask for written submissions afterwards. Sometimes they just like to hear or- oral argument at a particular point. More often than not, they'll ask for briefs. It's not all the time. But the judge usually has a decision or has it has it made up their mind where they want to go. Sometimes they take the briefs in as just kind of a a CYA, right? Just to see if they miss anything on the cases. But when the judge hears the argument, more often than not, they know which side they want to side with. And then, you know, it's taking time to write the opinion. And then just another maybe behind the scenes for us, the, for the non-lawyers, sometimes the, what the judge will do is will take pieces from the written submissions to help write their ultimate decision, if there is a written decision on point. So, you know, it's some of the reason uh, just behind the scenes what goes on. So, yes, you have the associates at the law firm working day and night on this case, but the judge should know, Judge Robinson should know at this point which side she's going to go in. It's very rare that someone in the papers could sway you from one side or the other. Just my experience that that seems to be rare. Dan, agree, disagree on that on that point? Well, I think it's a little bit different with an appeal. Like if you're if you're a judge on an appellate court, you've read the briefs ahead of the oral argument and you've read the record. So on an appellate bench, I think, you know, the, the, the judges pretty much are pretty much close to have they have their minds made up and they may have some questions or uncertainties. But on, on, on this level of right. fact finding, I think there's a very important role that the briefs play here in organizing the evidence, marshalling the evidence and structuring it in a way to show that the burden of proof has been satisfied. I think the judge certainly has some, you know, you know her, her, of her own ideas as to how everything lines up. But the brief puts it all together. And I think a trial judge is more reliant on the briefs post hearing than appellate court judge might be in in a different setting where they're already familiar with the record. It will be the it will be up to the NFL and the NFLPA Watson's lawyers to really breathe life into this evidentiary record and tell a story, because I think during the trial, they're putting on the evidence. Maybe there's an opportunity for a closing argument, but the brief is basically a, a, a lengthier, more comprehensive version of that closing argument with citations to the record, with pinpoint sites to this person's testimony, that person's testimony. So I think it plays, I think the briefs play a bigger role than they ordinary than, than they would in an appellate proceeding, no question about it. But I don't think she has her mind entirely made up yet. Let's hold here for a second, Dan. I didn't preface you for what I'm about to say, but uh, I want to ask you a little bit about the burden of proof, but we're going to do it in the form of a game show. Are you ready, Dan? Yep. Go fire away. Uh, are there presents or <laughs> gifts? I mean, what's the... uh, well, I don't know, Dan. It's, it's what's behind door number two? We're going we're gonna to make this up on the spot. So I'm going to name you a number of different types of burdens of proof, and you're going to have to name them in the order from lowest to highest. How about that? Okay, this is an easy one since I just did a podcast on this today. You uh, throw in a couple my, of questions. 
Well, this might be part of the reason uh, that we, we were doing this and to educate some of our, our, uh, our listeners here. Okay, let's start, Dan. And for those not watching on video, Dan is cracking his neck. He is ready for this game show. He's ready to go. Okay, Dan, you have a pen and paper? You have this ready to go? I, I don't need any, any I'm going to give you four. I'm going to give you four of them. Or, yeah. Okay. No, no particular order, but you have to spit them back out to me from the easiest to satisfy all the way to the top. Okay? Number one preponderance of the evidence number two probable cause number three credible evidence and number four beyond a reasonable doubt now dan the clock is on i need the easiest to satisfy all the way up to the hardest to satisfy well, you're gonna give and you're up. okay well the most difficult to satisfy is going to be criminal standard of proof which is proof beyond a reasonable doubt which is what the accused in a criminal setting are you know held to meaning the state has to prove by, by, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt that the, that the defendant committed the crime. That's the most stringent standard of uh, evidentiary review in the law. Below You're that. You're one for one. You're one for below one. That, you missed one, Dan. You I, missed, I, I you, didn't you, miss them. I gave you four random the, ones. The, the fifth standard of review right below that is clear and convincing evidence. We're in a civil lawsuit. Okay. I'll, I'll go one. I'll, I'll answer in your order. Preponderance of the evidence is right below that. That's the standard of proof, the burden of proof that a plaintiff has to satisfy in a civil lawsuit when the uh, goal or the objective is to either secure monetary relief or declaratory or injunctive relief. That's not a criminal penalty. The burden is preponderance of the evidence and the the I guess the plain language you know translation of that is you have to show that it's more likely than not or more probable than not people like to say 51 percent or 50.001 percent that that really does a disservice it's not a formula it's just a, an assessment of whether it's more likely than not that the alleged violation occurred in between those two standards is clear and convincing evidence, which is sort of between preponderance and proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And you have to, you have to show clear and convincing evidence quite, you, quite often in fraud cases where you're alleging civil fraud. Uh, un, yeah. There was a reason I didn't ask you about that one, though, because that doesn't come up in any of the Watson stuff. But, Dan, you get bonus points here. You're showing off at this point. Okay. Underneath preponderance of the evidence, you mentioned two other standards of proof probable cause and credible evidence. And Bingo. I would go credible evidence is the standard of proof that appears in the NFL personal conduct policy. In my view, that falls below probable cause because probable cause is the standard that attaches to grand jury proceedings, right? Or, you know, entitlement to a search warrant. Uh, you have to make a showing of probability. Uh, maybe that's not a technical enough definition or a precise. No, I'll take it. I'll take but it. I think I think it's I think it's a higher showing than credible evidence. Where credible Agreed. evidence, you don't have to show probability. You don't have to show more likely than not. You can just cherry pick one strand of evidence and say this piece of evidence tends to support the finding, even if all these other pieces of evidence are in conflict with it or even outweigh it. So the, it allows the judge to disregard conflicting evidence and just make a finding on a single solitary strand of evidence. And that standard is baked into the NFL's personal conduct policy, which unsurprisingly was never negotiated with the players association. So the reason uh, and, uh, there was a, then that was maybe the first and last edition of uh, evidentiary standard uh, uh, game show over here. But listen, the reason I asked you those four, listen, you're showing off with clear and convincing, but I'm going to give you an A plus in my class, Dan, hopefully when you teach the class of sports, I'd get an A plus in yours as well. But let's let's go over it for a second, right? We have no active criminal cases against Watson, but that standard would be beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the highest standard. Whenever people ask me to explain it, I say that's a number. I make up the number. It's not a real number. But like 80%, 85%, it's a very high number, whatever you want to say, but it's very high. 50.0001, that's preponderance of the evidence. That's what we're dealing with now, which, Dan, I'm going to give you the, the runway to talk about. Now, beneath that are two that we that have come up in the course of this to show Watson case. It's a little bit of a refresher for people that have been with us since day one. Probable cause was the standard that Deshaun Watson faced when he went to the grand jury. So two separate grand juries did not proceed forward with these two indictments, and they said there was, uh, in theory, no probable cause. So beneath that, 
is this credible evidence standard. So I think for a lot of people, they, they remember, and Dan, you, you tweeted it today, Ezekiel Elliott would like a word, the evidentiary standard for him. And you cite to the standard, you know, there's a site that you, you quoted today that something was sufficiently credible. So that's usually where we're dealing with an NFL personal conduct policy. But Dan, now I'm going to give you the runway. This is, a, this is the Wallach hour at this point. What is the standard that Deshaun Watson is dealing with, right? I know there's been some reports today, but I want to give you the credit. The story's all emanated with you. Beyond a preponderance of the evidence is where we're at. How did we get there? And, and do you think that's the correct standard to be applied here? Well, it's the standard that the NFL has acquiesced to. You know, earlier today, I don't know, we're, I don't know when this is going to, it's going to come out a day after the news broke. But I wrote an article last week that said that I don't care. I took the credible evidence standard from the personal conduct policy. And I said, I'm sorry, that's not going to be the standard of proof. It can't be the standard of proof because this isn't an appellate proceeding. Credible evidence is usually a standard of appellate review to assess the, you know, whether there was enough evidence to support a jury finding. You had some, you know, credible evidence usually goes hand in hand with review of factual determinations that are made below. It's never the standard of, of review or the burden of proof in a first level contested adversarial proceeding where there are going to be factual findings made. It's only a review standard, not a sort of trial standard. And not surprisingly, my research, and I, and I wrote this article for Conduct Detrimental's website called, can you know, Judge Robinson you know, make or raise the standard of proof on the NFL? And my, my conclusion was yes, because this credible evidence standard is constitutionally infirm. Whenever there have been cases or judicial decisions on this point in contested adversarial proceedings, the courts have held that that, that violates a, an accused's procedural due process rights because it allows a fact finder to disregard other evidence and focus only on one strand of evidence and it places the brunt of the risk on the accused, not on the state, not on the plaintiff, not on the complainant. And the Second Circuit has held that that standard violates the due process clause of the U.S. Constitution. And the NFL is based in New York. And I would think that if they tried to go with a, with a credible evidence standard, they could face some potential judicial uh, invalidation of that later on down the road. And I also took a look at the credible evidence language in the personal conduct policy, and it's permissive. It's not even mandatory or compulsory language. It, it, it says- that, I, love, I love that you're holding it up right now. You, you took your no, notes, you haven't printed and, out. You know, what, they're, what, they're, what they're not saying, Dan, is I'm holding up the wrong document. I was holding up the you know, article- No one knows, you're good. Now I'm holding up the correct document. <laughs> the correct document is the personal conduct policy. And I don't know if you've ever come across this, you know, I'm, a, I, I'm an appellate lawyer by training and, you know, the, the, the tools of an appellate lawyer are, pre, are, are basically interpret, interpretive tools, rules of statutory interpretation, rules of contract interpretation. You, you use those as weapons to pick apart arguments or to parse language. And one of the, one of the interpretive tools that I've gone to the well on is something that Justice Scalia calls the mandatory permissive canon which is when the word shall is used in a sentence, obviously, I mean, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand this, it, it's mandatory. It, it, it applies because the word shall or must is used, but when the word may appears in a clause, well, that's optional, that's permissive. Now, against that backdrop, let me read the credible evidence language. In cases where a player is not charged with a crime or is charged but not convicted, he may, still be found to have violated the policy if, if the credible evidence establishes that he engaged in conduct prohibited by this personal conduct policy. By the way, that's really bad drafting when they use the defined term policy and then say personal conduct policy in the next line. The point is that the use of the permissive may in that language, which is really the only place in the, in the policy where the words credible evidence appears, suggests to me that Judge Robinson could decide not to apply it. It's at her option whether to apply that standard to find that somebody violated the personal conduct policy. So anyway, I, I, I tortured myself over the last three or four days writing this, you know, 2,400 word piece where I laid out six or seven reasons 
why the NFL has to abide and why Judge Robinson should abide by a preponderance of the evidence standard rather than credible evidence. And one other key point is that when, Je when Roger Goodell issued his arbitration ruling in the Deflategate case seven years ago, he made the statement that the governing standard of proof in Article 46 proceedings was the preponderance of the evidence standard. And he made that statement at a time when the NFL had already issued their personal conduct policy that had a credible evidence standard. And, and Article 46 encompasses both the conduct detrimental type proceedings, you know, ding, 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 and personal conduct policy violations. So he's basically saying the proof standard in all of Article 46 is preponderance of the evidence. And some people might say, well, you know, he didn't really mean all of Article 46. Well, he's, that's what he said. And his, his arbitration ruling was undoubtedly reviewed by NFL lawyers, by outside counsel Paul Weiss. So his lack of a law degree and lack of sophistication on evidentiary standards, uh, he had so many guardrails in place where people were reviewing that opinion and marking it up and changing it. So it says what it means and it means what it says. And not surprisingly today, uh, Josina Anderson from CBS Sports, our guest on the show last week, clarified with the National Football League that they acknowledge that the governing standard of proof in this proceeding with Deshaun Watson is preponderance of the evidence. Just so everyone's clear, what's coming out from Josina Anderson is that what Dan predicted in his article is correct, right? Josina Anderson tweets, the league source on the threshold of proof expected to be applied by Sue Robinson. Quote, the NFL has the burden of proof and it is by the preponderance of evidence. And there is no dispute about that. There is precedent in case law that establishes it. So, Dan, you, you kind of spoke it into existence, so to speak. I don't think anybody was on this. So, Dan, I'm here to give you your flowers. I'm here to pump you up constantly. Well, you know who's mad at me now? It's Ezekiel Elliott. Ezekiel, Zeke. Yeah, Zeke is wondering, Dan, where the heck were you like five years ago on That's that? great question. Yeah. I was around five years ago, and while today the NFL you had, acknowledges- You had a few thousand less followers, so people weren't paying attention to you. No, 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 no. I, I, was, I, I definitely had some traction in Zeke, but I didn't raise this point. And that's the amazing thing about all these different cases. Just when you think you understand you know, all the nuances of Article 46 and the personal conduct policy, there were new wrinkles that all these subsequent cases bring to light. And what I didn't realize in 2017 that I realized today is that, well- the, the credible evidence standard can't possibly be the standard utilized in a disciplinary proceeding in which factual findings are made. But that's precisely what the NFL did in the Zeke case. You had the disciplinary determination made by an NFL employee back in 2017, and he used the sufficient credible evidence standard. And I highlighted that, and you, 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 you read it as well. So Ezekiel Elliott was held to a standard of proof that was illegal the entire time and nobody argued it. I didn't notice it. The NFLPA didn't argue it. And his six game suspension was basically upheld and had his case arisen you know, five years later when I became five years smarter, I might've been able to help the dude out. Can I, I'm only I, laughing. I feel, I feel bad. I want to apologize to him. There's an expression, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but Dan, I think you're, 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 Kind of breaking that trend you're saying that you're learning things uh later in life becoming smarter in your old age i feel no, like people lose brain that, cells it's just that when you make a mistake you tend to obsess over it. it it wasn't a mistake i didn't make a mistake but i learned something and and the more of these cases that we hold under the microscope or under the, the spotlight and read every word now we're veterans of a couple of these cases where when when the Zeke case came around, it moved so quickly. That was like the first or second case. Now we're like holding this personal conduct policy up to the light, examining every word. And we come away with like different nuances that weren't apparent to us in the prior case. You know, the most important of which is the, the burden of proof. I mean, this policy has been around since 2015, seven years. And now because of this article I write and, you know, this new clarification for the first time, the NFL is conceding that this is the policy or this is the burden of proof that applies to a policy that was enacted seven years ago. 
Listen, well, hopefully the, the decision will, will cite to your article, Dan. That, that would be a real win. You know, speaking of uh, of the decision when it comes out, Dan, you're giving me a face. You never know. No, no, no. The reason I say that is that, you know, while I love the title of our podcast, I, I, I can't imagine a judge citing a, a publication that has the words conduct detrimental. Hey, I, you you make fun of me with this. You go, you name the podcast very well. It keeps coming up. And yeah, other and other podcast, publications but... have to say the name of our podcast, and then people search for it in Google, and guess what comes up? We come up, Dan. One final footnote to put to put in this, which I think is another one, Dan. Article forty six of the NFL CBA states that once a decision is rendered by the disciplinary officer, an appeal by either side shall be made in writing within three business days, and any response to the appeal should be filed in writing two business days thereafter. So, Dan, you were mentioning at the top that there would be an appeal, or there still can be appeal. There has to be at least five days baked into the written submission. So we'll Obviously. see. We're still we're still a little ways away from there. But once we get the decision in late July, assuming that's when it happens, I don't. I actually think it might be a little bit longer, but I'm happy to be wrong on that. Um, you still need to bake in some time for the for the appeal here yeah, to Goodell to Goodell, not to the courts. I don't know that. I, I mean, I made my bones as an appellate lawyer, but I was like king of the ex, you know motions for an enlargement, extensions of time. You didn't even have to file your brief right away. You had, a, you had 30 days to file a notice of appeal in standard appellate practice in federal and state court. And then you could just, you, you could just. Well, then you got like six months to perfect. And then you could always get the enlargement on the perfection. Yeah. yeah. Look, look at the Florida sports betting case. That is one that I highlighted earlier today. That appeal was filed November 21st of 2021. And the briefing schedule only came out, you know, on Friday, you know, almost seven months after the notice of appeal was filed. By contrast, the NFL appellate system is like is like all, all all business, no BS. You not you don't just file a notice of appeal; you have to file your legal argument within three days of Judge Robinson's disciplinary decision. So that's right out of the gate. Not the notice, but the actual argument and the scope of appellate review here is not like de novo, like we tend to sometimes see in the state and federal court system, where depending upon the type of ruling it is. An appellate court can review the correctness or the, you know, the merits of the underlying ruling. It doesn't work that way in the NFL appeal system from Article 46 disciplinary determinations. It's a lot more limited than just reviewing the merits. Let's pause there for a quick second. Dan, you, you and I were talking offline, right, about what Roger Goodell can do on appeal. We talked about in our, in our long Twitter spaces about if if Judge Robinson gives any type of discipline, one game, two games, three games, as long as there's some discipline, Roger Goodell could come in and ins- insert the amount of games that he wanted. So, Dan, I'll, you probably can explain it better than I can. But in terms of what Goodell is looking for in the record, how does that review and that, and that I don't know, that research that Goodell is doing into the record, how does that differ from a normal standard that you would see in this type of situation? Sure, sure. First of all, it doesn't have to be a modification of the punishment if it's in games, meaning he can take two games and raise it. It could just be counseling, right? right let, let, me, let me read his standard. His birth for appellate modification is limited. He can't review the merits of the decision. He can only modify the amount of the discipline, meaning if Judge, if, if Judge Robinson finds that Deshaun Watson has not committed a violation of the personal conduct policy, it's over. It's over because uh, there's no punishment. There's no discipline. There's nothing to modify. But if she finds a violation to have occurred in one or more of these alleged victims cases, she doesn't have to impose suspension of games as a discipline. She could she could order counseling. She could order a fine. And the really interesting thing about Roger Goodell's discretion here is he can modify the amount of discipline. It doesn't have to be similar discipline. It could go from she she imposes you know a requirement that he seek you know mental health counseling. Well, Goodell can turn that into a, a game suspension and go from counseling and a warning to an indefinite suspension of one year or more. And I'm going to read the language from Article 46, which governs Roger Goodell's appellate authority. It says the appeal. Okay, the disciplinary officer's disciplinary determination is final and binding, subject only to the right of either party to appeal to the commissioner. The appeal shall be limited to arguments why, based on the evidentiary record below, the amount of discipline, if any, should be modified. So 
the, the key words in that sentence are evidentiary record. That's important to me. What struck me about those words is that it suggests to me that Roger Goodell, when he's acting as the appeals judge, isn't bound to the reasoning used by Judge Robinson in her disciplinary determination in assessing punishment. He can make his modification based on the evidentiary record, not the judge's decision, but on the evidentiary record as interpreted by Roger Goodell. So by way of example, you know, Judge Robinson could issue this detailed written opinion with all these factual findings based on her interpretation of the evidentiary record and come to the conclusion that this only merits a two game suspension. Roger Goodell is not limited to following her lead on her reasoning or how much weight she accorded these findings or how severe of the, the discipline should be. If he can find any basis in the evidentiary record, not in her ruling, but in the evidentiary record, which is the testimony, the investigative findings, all the record evidence, he can base a decision uh, to raise the amount of discipline solely by reviewing the record consisting of the evidence without any deference whatsoever to what uh, disciplinary officer Judge Robinson concluded based on that evidentiary record. He owes her no deference and is not beholden to anything that she rules other than he can't change the merits or the outcome on the liability issue, but he's not beholden or hamstrung by anything she determines in the way of punishment. Okay, so I think that's everything you know we wanted to get to on Watson that save for predictions, which we did want to get into. So I'll, I did mention I wanted to talk a little bit about Baker Mayfield, and I'm happy to take this side of the coin. You know, I'm looking, you know, up in front of me on my screen, I got the Browns depth chart. This might be a very rudimentary way of, of trying to make a prediction, but Dan, we're not listening to the hearings. We don't know what's going on. Dan, there's been reports. I will say this is probably the only thing we, we should talk about substantively before I talk about the Browns depth chart. They're only really looking, Dan, at four women here. So the alleged acts that Watson is being assessed for, it's not 66 masseuses in the 17 months. It's not the 24 women that, you know, filed cases. It's four women. We don't know which of the four, the Venn diagram of the 24, the 67, the four that settled. I don't know if it's the four remaining individuals that haven't settled their cases. We have no idea of that number. But keep in mind, that's what's being assessed here. It's not whether Watson committed all the acts. It's whether, with respect to those four, that, you know, his... um, you know, his, uh, I want to say guilt, but whether he pre- he committed these acts beyond a preponderance of the evidence. So here are the clues that we have, right? I don't know. You took a look at two grand juries that didn't find there to be probable cause. So that's maybe one certain clue in that, in that favor. But then again, you talk to enough people around Harris County, you know, the DA's office uh, tends to be a political entity. You know, I don't think you can necessarily say that's an automatic win. What I will say, and this is my, my comment about the depth chart, People could say I'm crazy. I, I, I listen. I'm happy. People can disagree from they want. I think it's a, an interesting message that the Browns send in the middle of these hearings while we're waiting to figure out if Deshaun Watson is going to get an indefinite suspension of an indefinite length, indefinite being more than a year. They trade Baker Mayfield, and he's again most expensive insurance policy in all of football. They trade him. So now if Watson doesn't play, right? They have Jacoby Brissett and Josh Dobbs as their quarterback. So, Dan, my prediction, if you're going to set the over-under here at 10 and a half games, let's actually set a little bit higher. Let's set the over-under at 14 and a half games. I'll go with the under. I'll take it. I think that's what the message that the Browns are sending. I think if you look at the grand jury, it's at least one, um, I don't know, one decision tree in this case where at least one grand jury or at least some group of people didn't think there was enough to get probable cause with respect to a handful of the of the complaints. So I'm going to take the under on 14 and a half, Dan. That's, that's my prediction. I think the preponderance of the evidence standard is going to be really meaningful for Deshaun Watson because now, um, instead of having a shred or a strand or an iota of evidence that the NFL can use to you know win, win the hearing, now they're going to have to prove it's more likely than not. And how do they do that without live witness testimony? Right. I mean, if you're if you're a civil plaintiff's lawyer and you want to make your case in chief and you have all these witnesses and none of them show up for the trial and just reading deposition transcripts into the record, geez, that's OK, because those are subject to cross-examination. None of these witnesses 
were cross-examined. They were just interviewed by the National Football League. So how how can the league show that, how does Watson contradict any of their testimony? And I think the raising of the burden of proof coupled with the, li- with the lack of live witness testimony makes the NFL's burden here more difficult than usual because, be- because the only evidence they're going to have are their own findings, their own investigative reports, which are the byproduct of witness interviews. And those witnesses were never subject to cross-examination by Watson's legal team. Maybe they were in some of the civil depositions. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot we don't know about the record. So it's difficult to make a prediction. But I think the swinging of the burden of proof in Watson's favor, coupled with, you know, this is a federal judge that's going to be hearing evidence on disparate discipline, meaning the lack of discipline accorded to, 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 to Robert Kraft, Jerry Jones, and to um, Dan Snyder, and I think that could resonate with uh, with, with Judge Robinson. So I'm I, I don't see this as being a full season suspension, at least from the hands of Judge Robinson. She's probably going to issue some amount of discipline, some level of suspension, but anything she does, the NFL is going to be able to run with that and take an appeal to Roger Goodell, and then he could just refashion a remedy and impose the original recommended discipline. So what can she do? to ensure that both parties are equally happy and equally unhappy. And I think she kind of finds some middle ground to give the NFL its pound of flesh and to give Deshaun Watson some hope that he'll be able to play in the future. And I think that middle ground is somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 games. And then we, we should say, we didn't mention this in the show, two people we did mention, Mike Florio and Josina Anderson, have both reported that the NFL presented no evidence of violence, force, threat, or coercion concerning the allegations of the five, uh, I think it's now four women they focused on. So I guess that's it. So Dan's saying eight to 10, I'm taking under 14 and a half. So I guess we're both both on the same page here. Well, that's huge, um, Dan. That's huge, Dan. huge, Dan. The absence of any threats, physical violence, or coercion takes away the minimum six-game suspension as a baseline and gives Judge Robinson a wide range of sentencing discretion where she doesn't have to do a minimum of six games. She could she could go lower than that or maybe even counseling or some fine or something that isn't a suspension. And I think that's a very favorable development or an admission that the league made that I think could help Watson's hopes in getting back onto, onto the field during the 2022 regular season. So these well, are all developments. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's positive, but... It's two reports. The NFL, I, I imagine, I have a feeling that line was probably given by the Deshaun Watson camp. I don't think the NFL would 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 choose to admit that on their own. So I know you, you use the term admission. I think that's just that, that seems to be from from Watson's side. Um, but that's it. So you know, there you have it. We'll see if we're wrong. It is what it is. The NFL was going for a year suspension and then of an indefinite length. And now we're thinking it might be a little bit less than that. Okay. Dan, I don't have anything else to add on the Watson front. Uh, I think we've emptied the tank here. I think at this point, we're pretty deep into the podcast, but a good time to remind our, our listeners, our podcast is sponsored by Themis Bar Review, the top bar prep company in the galaxy. We um, you know, spoke to a couple of you guys this week that are in final, final stages of prepping for the bar. Um, many of you, many of our friends are using Themis. So we appreciate the support for Themis. If you're using Themis, listen, this is the time. Uh, I, I don't mean this lightly. A lot of a lot of you are thinking self doubt. You're scoring badly on these MBE sections, these essay sections. Listen, this is what they do. They make them really hard, and the test when you get there, it's not as bad. So they want you to feel this way. If you're feeling stressed right now, that is good. If you didn't feel stressed, that would be bad. But Themis Bar Review, if you're using them, I'd, I'd feel pretty confident. If you're not using them, I'm not so sure. But you know, uh, listen, I have faith in you guys. Okay, Dan. The other big news. We didn't want to spend so long on this, but we, we couldn't go a podcast without uh, addressing it in some way, shape, or form. The PGA Tour is now under investigation by the Department of Justice. Once that news came out, the Wall Street Journal had it. Uh, I got a, an email from a hungry law student, Robert Alston. No relation to Sean Alston. We, we checked with him. He's a, uh, a student of our, a good friend of ours, Gabe Feldman. He's at Tulane Law School. And he emailed us and he said he wanted to write a piece for, you know, for the website. And as fate would have it, we got a, a message from another friend of ours, Joe Pompliano, who runs a, a big lo- newsletter, a big, you know, a couple tens of thousands of people subscribed. And he asked if we would write a piece for the website. So that's what you get when you reach out. Robert reached out just as I was hearing from Joe. And bing, bang, boom, by the time many of you will listen to this, the article will be out already. So we're going to bring Robert Olson on for the last portion of the podcast to fill everybody in on what's going on with the PGA and live. And now enter the DOJ. So without further ado, let us kick it over. 
to Robert Alston. Welcome to Conduct Detrimental, Robert Alston. How's it going, my man? Good, Dan. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate you guys you know, with, uh, letting me come on. I was going to say, with a name like Alston, we are not talking about college sports. We are talking about the PGA Tour. I don't want to bury the lead here. What is the latest on the PGA Live front? So the DOJ uh, initiated a probe today. Several PGA players and their agents were contacted, inquiring into potential monopolization conduct of the PGA surrounding their uh, actions with the LIV. So uh, it's it's funny. I've been calling it LIV, but uh, I guess we call it LIV, LIV. So, you know, that was the update today. Wall Street Journal had the report that came out, you know, that the DOJ is going to be investigating the PGA. We've been we've explained this and some people are taking credit for predicting this. But we said for a while, what, what's going on here is a competition between two entities, Live Golf and the PGA Tour. And the more golfers that went from the PGA to Live, you have to think about what the PGA's response is going to be. So, you know, I think the last time we hit this, John Nucci was on our, our podcast, you know, uh, contributed to the show. And Robert, we should mention you're a rising 3L at Tulane. I hear the accent. Um, let me guess. Are you from uh, somewhere in the southeast? Yep. Mobile, Alabama. So, again, it's strange that you, we are not talking college sports. We'll probably have you on at different times to do that. <laughs> I wrote my what? case note on NCAV Austin, funny enough. It's a shocker. And no, no relation to Sean Austin, I should, I should ask you. Nope, no relation. So let's let's do this. Give us a little bit of background. We'll, we'll you know we won't we won't stay it for too long. But for those that have kind of been watching this dormant, who what are the types of golfers that have been going over? And what are, what's the type of money that we're we're seeing? You know, kind of to induce some of these players to move over. Yeah. So really, it's all really all types of golfers. You have bottom players such as Robert Garrigus and new players James Pyatt. He just won the U.S. Amateur a couple of years ago. Uh, recently on the PGA Tour, he went over. And you have champions, your household names. You have Phil Mickelson, Bryson DeChambeau, Kevin Na, Brooks Kepka, Patrick Reed, Patrick per- uh, Pat Perez, Dustin Johnson. Like you said, it's about money, essentially. Um, the Live Tour, the payout for the winner is $4 million. The minimum they're going to make is $120K. There's a $25 million total purse. There are no cut events. In comparison, a couple of weeks ago, the Barbasol Championship, the PGA, only seven players took home more than 120000 so, Wait, only only seven players took home more than what was the minimum for the live event. Correct. And then half those players okay. obviously went home with nothing as they didn't make the cut. And do the PGA players get to ride on those fancy uh, private planes that I'm seeing uh, <laughs> the live guys do? No, they don't get the fancy no, hotels do not. or anything. No. Shocker. The comments that really struck me, and uh, obviously well, these are going to be dissected, but um, Jay Monahan, the conference commissioner, June 22nd, um, has a quote that comes out. He says, I am not naive if this is an arms race. And if the only weapons here are dollar bills, the PGA Tour can't compete. So the way I read that statement, you know, I, I don't really know, right? If you're not going to be competing for money, right, which is, I guess, the, the, at the core of what a capitalist economy would be, free agency, right? People are competing for money. How are you going to compete? What type of anti-competitive practices are you going to partake in, right? I think that's the question here. And I'm, I'm guessing, and you know, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm, I'm guessing that statement had a lot to do with the DOJ's announcement, right? Definitely. And then later in the press conference, he announced dramatic changes to their schedule, including raising the purse $5 million for eight of the tournaments in the PGA. Uh, He made three no-cut events, created three no-cut events with the Arnold Palmer, the Genesis, and the Memorial. The only reason he conceivably could have done this was to compete with the LIV to keep up with the monopolization power they have. I guess it's it's a thing, right? You can compete in terms of a monetary sense, but if you're going to compete, I, I guess the way I read Monaghan's statement is like, we have other tactics other than money to keep the PGA Tour afloat, which get me concerned on an antitrust level, right? And again, and, uh, when we actually, we, we did mention this, Robert. You have an article that, that you know, we're going to finalize, but it's going to be out in Joe Pompliano's newsletter tomorrow, the, the hustle, which uh, I, I read every morning. But, you know, in it, we get, you get into a little bit these, uh, you know, the comments from the, the DOJ's press release. But the antitrust sanctions against AT&T in 1974, Microsoft in 1998. And, and this appears to be, right, yet another big company, the PGA, right, that's being accused of flexing its muscle to maintain that monopolistic power. So I don't know, why don't you give us a, a feel for what happens next year? Well, we can take a look over in um, Britain. Uh, Ian Poulter, he filed for a preliminary injunction. He was uh, banned from he, playing. In the... Ian Poulter's like a mid-level golfer, we'll say, yeah, right? He's, he was... In the golf world, is pretty well known. Um, in Britain, he's famous, obviously. But he's I would say he's a household name. 
Um, but yeah, so he filed preliminary injunction or for a preliminary injunction for the Scottish Open, the DP World Tour, which is the European tour now. They banned him from playing in the Scottish Open, and a British court granted him an injunction and allowed him to play. So conceivably, I could see PGA Tour players doing this as well in American courts if they're banned from playing what in are, a PGA Tour event. What are the? I mean, this is this is probably the important precedent on point. What are the live violations that Poulter had that he was banned from the Scottish Tour? Just playing in a live event. Just playing. Just playing. That's it. Just showing up, taking the money as and playing golf. See, I'm curious as to, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm sure we can look this up. I'm curious what the Scottish Open's reasoning was for punishing him. Like, you just you associated with the live tour and that was worthy of his suspension because the exactly. PGA is not doing that. Exactly. And then you have the issues with, well, the issues is that the live tour, where the money comes from, Saudi's public investment fund is controversial. And the DP World Tour doesn't want to be associated probably with players that are associated with that kind of money. Same thing goes with the PGA. They want to preserve their legacy. Monaghan's talked about that plenty of times. I guess here's what I'm looking for in the future, right? You, you note in your article, a number of players have been suspended. A number of players have kind of withdrawn, with, withdrew from the PGA. Mm-hmm. Not all of them, right? And I think most famously, Phil. So mm-hmm. what, what do we have to look forward to? You know, if you're a legal nerd over here, right? We're looking at the DOJ's investigation. But we're also looking forward to, um, you know, what, what Phil wants to do if he has that type of you know, at this point in his his life, right, uh, Phil might just want to challenge the PGA, as he noted in his book. He wants to challenge the authority, so we'll see. But that's what we're monitoring here. But Robert did an excellent job of breaking this down and filling everybody in. Anything else that we didn't touch upon that that uh, our audience should be looking out for? Um, I would just note that some PGA Tour players, like Dustin Johnson and Kevin Na, have fully renounced their membership to PGA. So I wouldn't look to them at getting involved in any potential lawsuits with the PGA or even trying to get a preliminary injunction that we spoke about earlier. Yeah. Besides that, I think we covered a lot of it, Dan. Appreciate you guys having me on. Excellent job. And we uh, will uh, send out the link to your article when we have it tomorrow. Appreciate it, Robert. Great job. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Thanks, Robert. So that was Robert Alston of Tulane University School of Law, rising 3 all over there. But yeah, he's also just a contributor to the side and he's someone that messages us a lot about you know, the PGA, the live battle. And, um, you know, we obviously had to give him the opportunity to jump on the pod and obviously co-write an article that you guys will see tomorrow. Okay. So probably a good note at this point, Dan, as we put this episode in the books, this is Dan this week, this time last year, we launched conductdetrimental.com. We had Dan Worley on, former co-host of the podcast with you, we talked about it. I was also in the hospital this time last year with my uh, youngest daughter being born this time last year, July 16th. So big uh, anniversary in a couple of occasions. So Dan, uh, in an anniversary, you write a big article. You write that uh, the Sue Robinson piece that got picked up by a couple outlets. So all things uh, looking good in the world of Conduct Detrimental. Dan, what do you what do you think of the first year of the Conduct Detrimental.com member? Any, any observations? Well, I mean, if it's a one year anniversary, one year anniversary, it's 365 days. We already have like 525 articles published. Wow. We're, we're like going some days, you know, to a clip, you know, three a clip. Uh, 525 is pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, it shows you the, uh, you know, sort of the, 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 the breadth of the sports law community. There's so many really, you know, smart lawyers who who have a, an interest in sports law that like you know covering some of the topics they're not just law students a lot of you know seasoned lawyers are writing are writing pieces so our our community has grown you know by leaps and bounds i never would have expected that we're over 500 i, I never expected a website let alone 500 articles in, in, in you know within a one, within one year with a podcast twitter spaces uh you know conduct, conduct cast, cast. Jinx, uh, you owe me a Coke. We keep going. We spent too much time together. And some of the some of the you know great talent that we've had on our podcast. We we had Brian Windhorse before, you know, before the why is that fame. Now, yeah. why is that, Dan? Why is yeah. that? We, we, we got, we, we, you know, Darren Ravel several times. We've had, we've had some major guests, and I think we've we've done a great, a really great service in providing, you know you know, legal commentary around these complicated, sometimes complicated, you know, sports industry issues that land in the courts or land in some legal situation. And, um, and I get a charge of all that. I mean, I, I, for years, I spent, you know, my time handling appeals on cases that didn't involve sports. And, you know, I was motivated, you know, a lot to do a good job, but nothing like this. 
This is this is like it's your own case when you're trying to you know crack the code and break down what's happening in one of these ongoing legal controversies, whether whether they're Brady, Watson, Elliot, Adrian Peterson. There's so much fun, but the time has really uh, you know just sped by so quickly. I can't believe it's been a year since we've launched the website, and we're gonna have a lot more in store within the next year. We you know, we've talked about adding a couple of key components to conduct detrimental. And we'll have some surprises and interesting developments to talk about over the next couple of months. So Stan, you, you mentioned this community's developments. One, um, you know, we'll, we'll send an email out over the next week or so, but we did want, just like the example with Robert Alston today, and he'll, he'll listen to this afterwards. We, we want to tap people for certain sports. If a big issue comes up in basketball, or in baseball, we want to have a team of three or four people that we send, you know, here's the SOS, you know, we want to bring someone on the podcast, we want to have a team. And we did mention that the next phase of Conduct Detrimental would be kind of sports specific podcasts. We're still getting there. We're still trying to, you know, flag certain writers. Like we've had John Nucci on a bunch, Landis Barber on a bunch, you know, people that that come and write a couple of times, but, you know, you might not realize it. Like a guy like Landis Barber, I was telling him, you know, speaking to him on Friday, People know his name in the sports circles because he's writing constantly. Nucci has some of the most, um, you know, read articles on our site. People know the name, right? And I don't know. We're not gonna we're not gonna put up blow up anyone's spots. But again, people have gotten jobs from their prolific writing on the site. So, you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, man, I'd like to get involved in conduct detrimental, just tell me what sports you're into. Tell me what sports you're into and what you want to write about. And we want to build out a real roster here. And the next phase would be again sports specific topics, sports specific functions of the website. But um N- oh, that's, NFL that's do the NFL. NFL, NFL, <laughs> we can do them all. Dan, you're raising your hand. That's that's my alarm going off that I have a Dan, you're never gonna believe this. An eleven PM hit for Fox Sports Radio on the live stuff, on on a number of things. Look at, look at you a hit. Dan, can I tell you something? Well, now, now that the episode's ending, and I, we can keep this on the books, keep it recording. You want to hear what crazy thing I did on the weekend? And my wife thought I was insane, but it's a good story for the podcast. I wanted to tell it here. So I got a, a message from a Fox Sports radio producer. His name's Bernie Fratto. We, we follow each other. You know, I've been on a show once or twice. He messaged us from our um, our podcast that we did on Freddie Freeman and Casey Close. And he said, I listened to the podcast. It was, it was fantastic. You know, what you guys are doing with conduct is fantastic. And he goes, I'd love to have you on the show sometime. The problem is, Dan, my show is at 1115 Pacific. And he goes, I know you're in New York. And I'm like, I thought about it. And I'm like, okay, Bernie, I would love to come on your show. You tell me when I will come on. Dan, 2.15 a.m. I did it on a Saturday on a Saturday night. I set my alarm. I woke up and Dan, it wasn't just a late appearance. I didn't just wake up for it. I've done, uh, I have too many to count, hundreds of appearances at this point. That one I was most proud of, Dan, 2.15 a.m. I have never done an appearance, but I woke up, took my coffee. It was one of the best appearances I've done. But that's, Dan, that's the commitment. You writing articles on Saturday. I'm waking up at 2.15 in the morning. You know, we, we, we live and breathe this stuff. We don't, just, we don't just, like, you know, do this for show. Like, this is all, all I think about, all you think about. Reminds me of teaching. I, 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 taught, I taught a sports betting law and regulation course from Siberia, Russia, to students at the University of Miami School of Law. I literally, the class times were 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and 5 a.m. I don't know how I survived that. I'd much rather do a radio hit. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you, you just get, you know, the, these different time zones and, and, and you know, the stories are, are national stories now. So you, you, you're you going, you're jumping on these radio shows at, at, at all these odd times. But, you know, Pacific time, Hawaii, California. Yeah, that's a challenge sometimes. But yeah, congratulations, Dan. It's been it's been some run uh, with all these major cases. And I think Watson is beginning just a new level of it. Congrats to you, Dan. This is your baby. I'm just, uh, you know, help, helping us get to uh, the next phase, whatever that is. But this is all, all uh, in, your, in your mind. You put this thing into creation and uh, we're just helping push it past. So, Dan, I think that's a good place to end the podcast. Dan Wallach, myself, the Conduct Detrimental family. You can find us on ConductDetrimental.com or here on the podcast. If you've liked what you listened to for the um, for the last year, we really would appreciate it. I don't just say it. This podcast is free. I'd love if you could leave us a review. It really helps us uh, grow our podcast. You can ask for Dan, money. I thought you were going to ask for money. No, no. Well, we could do that later. We could ask for donations, but we're not. No, just kidding. Leave us a review. That would be really, really appreciated. Dan, anything to add before we put this nope. episode officially in the books? Nope.
uh, I think that covers it all. Otherwise, we're making our audience uh, suffer. But uh, uh, we covered a lot of today, a lot of ground today. So I have nothing else. Watson, LIV, another show, another week. Okay, that'll do it. We'll see you next time on another episode. Kind of detrimental. 